Awesome. All right. Welcome, everyone. So this is the SIGOT meeting for July 22nd, 2020. Uh, we have a light agenda, so we might get some of our time back. Uh, so I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so the first issue I had made a while ago, I think. Uh, let's see. So I, I wrote down some thoughts. We had discussed this, um, I don't know, like, a month and a half ago, something like that. It's been a while. Um, and then I finally actually wrote down the thoughts in my head. Um, have folks had a chance to sort of read this? Have some thoughts, ideas? So, are, is the current proposal to create three different TTL fields? I, I, I listed two options, and then okay. James was like, I want all the options at the same time. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, I just want to understand where we currently think we are with the proposal. Yeah, so I, I think I, I personally would be happy in either of these, or the technically the third option, which James suggested, which was in both places. Um, um, I don't know. I, I would feel like there needs to be a pretty strong reason if we don't want to specify the same thing multiple places and then like take the minimum or something. It's a little hard to reason about. Uh, I'm curious what you mean here, Jordan, about it being backwards and compatible. So today, if a signer sees a request for a cert and it has its own duration, configured so it says I issue certs for a year yep. and it's written to the existing API yep. and then in the next release we add a way for a client to say I would like a cert valid for a week it sounded like what you were suggesting is if the signer tries to issue that cert for a year we would reject that issuance and that's not backwards compatible <laughs> So I would actually say that that would be the correct behavior, right? Because even though the signer fails, the user's intent is correctly honored in the sense that they're not given something longer to ask for. I would like to find the user who would thank you for that behavior. Remember though, the only reason that you put in like the duration is you're asking for it. By default, it's unset. So like by default, no user gets broken until they ask to be Possibly uh, I, I think the, the both the request and the recommendation have to remain hence. It's up to the signer to determine the duration. So uh, of the particular variations of the user requested in the CSR spec, the approver asserts some thing as the I guess max, and obviously the signer already has a max. Where do folks land on the buckets of where it makes sense? I don't think I, I think it's. Um, I, I was going to say, I think it's fine for uh, a client to suggest an expiration and leave it up to the signer to be the decider. Um, more than that, I'm skeptical. I feel like that's pretty typical behavior for other PKIs as well. So were, were those two last comments saying that it should be a field in spec and we don't care, the approver doesn't, the approver is approving the spec but doesn't assert a behavior, I guess. Even even without special support, the approver can still refuse to approve something if it doesn't like how long the TTL is, right? Yeah, I don't see a reason for the signer to indicate anything in the API other than like here's your here's the result. Um, That's I agree with that. Um, Basically, if we only have the spec and the signer aspects, 
then you have to bake all policy that knows about particular requesters into the signer. That was my only thinking of letting that be part of the approval process. That seem the approver seems more likely to be doing things specific to the requester since it's presumably making sure the requester <laughs> should be allowed to have this cert. So I, I don't feel that strongly about it. Do, do Jordan, do you feel comfortable in the fact that if it is just in spec, uh, you could still have like an admission webhook enforce a policy saying that I see a CSR coming from Mo and Mo likes to do crazy things, so I'll, I'll make sure he can't have a really long cert by forcibly setting the, the field on the way in. You could do it in admission. I think if uh, if CSRs are used by nodes as part of cluster bring up, you might have a hard time um, putting oh, wait, a webhook on CSRs <laughs> if you're intending to self-host that webhook. Yeah. People do crazy stuff in static pods. And, and, I, and I salute them. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, it's not called out in this doc, but that was actually one one uh, interesting for, uh, first upstream use case for this field might be to have the kubelet understand when it has rotation enabled and turn down its TTL. Uh, sorry, this is, uh, there'll be, there may be a future proposal, but that, that yeah, was one well, of the I mean, use if, cases. If it's handling its own request and decides to set its own TTL, I don't think there's an issue there. I think the concern was just if you had an admission webhook on it and you needed it to be able to get everything up to be able to read the pod to serve your admission webhook, the weird stuff happens. Yeah. Okay. Is anyone uh, like uh, strongly against an addition to like spec that says, I, I don't know if it's duration or TTL or TPL hint or some something obviously describing the the lifetime. Uh, not after would, hint. Not a duration. Whatever. Huh? Duration hint, not after hint. Whatever. Yeah, like a not after hint. Yeah. Okay. So follow the CSR, um, the standard PTI variation of the names. Uh, I guess that CSR pins to or uh, X five one nine pins to a particular date and. For here, we probably want it to be a duration. Yeah. So, you sure you want a, a duration that would then be calculated based off of the not before on the cert, or the creation timestamp of the CSR? I I want I want to ask for a cert that will be valid for a week. That's what I want. Okay. And, and if I don't get to signing it for a week, and then I sign it, should it be good for another week? Yes. Or, because if I if I ask for it to be valid for a week and it takes you six days to sign it, then I didn't get a cert that's valid for a week. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, it's fair. Um, I don't necessarily feel strongly. I just just want some vague idea. But just... I mean, the the flags that we passed to the signer today are duration flags because that's a how it makes sense to express, like, how long do you want to issue certs for? Like, how long should they be valid? I, I think something similar for the from the client's perspective makes sense. Th that also, from a client's perspective, that lets them formulate the CSR they're going to request and not have to tweak it to, like, bump the time every time they submit that request. Yeah. yeah. I'm trying to think, like, I guess... Then if you had an approver say like, yeah, for three days, you're assuming that decision is made not based on absolute time. It, I, I don't see how it can be. Like the signer is asynchronous. So from the time I approve, like, like today, I, I say approve this, and then the signer signs it for some duration. Like, I don't know how long it's going to take for the signer to get to it. So I don't have a firm end date in mind as an approval. assuming one mode of it, though, 
right? Like, as opposed to I'm an approver, I know that Mo's last day at work is in two days and I'm going to give it to him, but only for two days, specifically the two days until he's gone. Yeah, ultimately it comes to the question of if we are asking for a duration, when does the clock start ticking on that duration? When it's submitted, when it's approved, when it's signed. Yep. Well, David, why does it have to be me that's got a last day? All right. I like when it's submitted because that makes sense to the to the user. The user at a certain time said, give me a cert that's good for seven days. It wasn't give me a futures contract for a cert that's good for seven days sometime next year. Yeah, I, I'm willing to argue that out on an, an API PR. Um, yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> next steps, uh, are folks happy with uh, a, um, a change to the existing certificate step to add the proposed behavior and then we just like I said indefinitely on that PR until we're happy and merge and then can right change it. That seems fine to me. Sounds good to me. Sure. Uh, okay. Uh, a little sad that James is not here, but I think he's on PTO. I kind of like to hear his opinion. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll tag him on the PRs and stuff so that way he can chime in too. Okay. All right, I think um, Tim and Jay, you guys have the next two items. Do you want to introduce it? Yeah, I'll let Jay take it. Cool. Sure, I'll get my, uh, let me uh, see if I can, yeah, there we go. I'm, I think I'm out of shadow now. Um, hi, I'm Jay Beal. I'm one of the uh, leads of the security audit working group. And um, I'm here to talk to you all about our about our request to uh, turn into a uh, SIG security. Um, so what you're this is perfect. Uh, I can I, Mo, I can share my screen, or if you want to keep that, um, if you want to keep the the charter up, that sounds that'd be perfect. Which would you would you like? Would you want you want me to share, or do you want to drive? I, I can just leave it up, no problem. Uh, that's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. This is nice. Okay, well, cool. So, um, and I'm, I'm realizing I'm in shadow. So I'm going to just adjust camera for a sec. Isn't that great for the recording and everybody's time? Thanks. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm here to basically talk about, um, about the, the, I think you are probably familiar with the third party, the security audit working group. Um, We've run, uh, we ran a, the first security audit um, of Kubernetes and that, that included building up um, a threat model. So a number of, number of people in this call were uh, donated their time and helped with that threat model. We really, we really appreciate it. Um, we, found, we found a lot out of doing the security audits um, and we realized that there was, that there was more uh, there was there's certainly more for us to do and more to be done in ter outside of just carrying in bugs um, and saying, hey, these are the, these are these are vulnerabilities that can go into the you know the PSC will start managing, um, announcing and fixing. Um, so we've had uh, we've had wider conversations and had a good number of people join in, and a lot of that and a lot of that energy started when we gave a talk at KubeCon, and. Um, and we just had a lot of security folks who were saying like, how do I, how do I get involved? I, I'm, you know, in particular, how do I get involved if I'm not looking to write code right now? Um, so uh, as we talked, we have a pretty wide group and there's a, there's a letter attached and kind of just talks about some of the different, um, some of the different people outside of the folks that had been on the security outworking group to start, um, who've, you know, signed the letter and, and are, are, you know, are part of this effort. So I'm just going to kind of tell you a little bit, you know, I, I know you can all read, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about, uh, about what's in this charter and, um, and then let us, and then let us discuss. So um, we've talked, we have uh, actually four members of the product security committee um, have helped build this charter. And, um, and so we've had a lot of talks about what we can do um, and what we can take on um, uh, 
to do either for or with the PSC. And so part of the, the early conversation was, was um, the public bugs, the ones that aren't, um, the ones that aren't embargoed. Um, we can help with that. Um, we can talk, we can help uh, set how the private fix and release process is set up, how the vulnerabilities are rated. Um, not run the bug bounty, but help define its scope. Um, what goes what goes in scope and out of scope. Um, working on basically, you know, how vulnerabilities are announced, and then how what's the what's the criteria in the process for supporting Kubernetes sub projects. Uh, the examples we cited there were dashboard Nginx, uh, ingress, the Nginx ingress, and uh, and the COPS installer. Um, um, the next part of this is actually kind of one of the biggest, and the thing that I'd like to I'd like to really uh, share is the idea of the idea of, of our proposal for SIG security is very focused on cross cutting. Um, we're not focused on code ownership. Um, so security community management and outreach. Um, the idea is um, we've talked to you know some of the folks who. Um, uh, we talked to, sorry, I'm just, apparently I'm nervous. Um, <laughs> so we're going to, we're, uh, um, we, one of the things we want to do is just, uh, is, is help handle the questions that come in from inexperienced users, you know, whether that's directing them to the SIG or to the SIGs or serving as a kind of, you know, cash, um, for the, okay, before you go and before you go and, and, uh, ask those questions of the SIG that's have to answer them 15 times. Um, you know, we can we give you an answer, and eventually that means that that'll that'll probably lead to us helping out on uh, documentation, whether that's the actual Kubernetes documentation or security related docs, which I'll come to next. So, the biggest thing I think in a lot of ways the biggest thing so the biggest thing in this section and one of the biggest things on this page is to provide an entry point for new contributors who are interested in security. Um, and the way we see it, like part of part of what we found as we as we've done the security audits, um, is that that kind of activity um, brings a lot of interest from traditional infosec people, and um, and so our hope is that we can basically give them um, a place to a place to to talk, a place to ask questions, to get routed to SIGs, um, um, or to just or to help with the things that aren't. That aren't specifically uh, writing code or writing docs. Um, so, I think I'll. I think that's that's honestly one of the biggest parts of this is um, is that outreach work and community management. Um, let's see the next uh, the next couple. So horizontal security documentation. This is something we're really that I'm really proud of um, that I'm really excited about, and that is there are two things in here that are really important. Um, one is the threat model. Um, it's basically keeping that threat modeling process going. Um, and the other is basically uh, security benchmarks or hardening guide. And um, two, of, two of the people in our group are, um, are Liz Rice and Rory McCune, who, who run the Kubernetes, who run the CIS Kubernetes benchmark um, for CIS. And um, they're really excited about coming and basically building um, a hardening guide, a benchmark here in the Kubernetes project, in the open instead of um, instead of on CIS's you know web portal with only the people who came to contribute to CIS. They're really excited about doing that through GitHub um, and doing that in the Kubernetes project, and and thus giving the Kubernetes project a lot more ability to influence the CIS guide. Um, because if there is an official Kubernetes guide, um, then uh, then the CIS guide will definitely um, will definitely be wow you, to reuse the word influenced. Um, so so uh, we've also uh, there were some there are a couple folks who were um, working on the security docs um, on the uh, on the uh, security docs sub project under the under SIG docs. It was starting to sputter out a little bit and. They were really excited, actually, about getting about making this a sub project of SIG security because, um, in their mind, it's a heck of a lot easier to um, to find security people who can write than to find documentation people who have security as a as a subject matter as a subject matter expertise. Um, and so that's 
the other big part of that horizontal security documentation. And then the last part is the security audit that we've been doing um, already. And basically, we're we're saying we'd like to uh, 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 we'd like to have that become part of a, a wider mission for uh, a security SIG. So um, we've. We've defined below a few sub projects to start. One's of course the ongoing third party security audit. Um, another is uh, security documents and documentation. And that documents is meant to mean things like hardening guides and such that aren't part of the how to use and the how to, um, you know, here's how pod security policies work. That's the documentation for pod security policies, but, but rather that kind of hardening guide. Um, and the other sub project for us was um, is focused on community discussion groups, making sure that we, um, making sure that we're providing um, more focused, more focused, and also just more contributors to help um, because Kubernetes, Kubernetes is certainly growing, and it's just, I swear, in a lot of ways, it's only in the last you know couple of years really started to attract the attention of the infosec, you know, kind of the infosec community at large they're still learning and they're still trying to figure out how they can, they're trying to figure out how they can help. They're also trying to figure out how they can wrap their brain around it. And um, I, I think we're going to, I think the Kubernetes project is going to see a ton of them um, coming as, you know, as, uh, as a lot of the good talks um, happen at the, uh, at the mainstream security conferences. So that's the, that's the, uh, I think that's the best way for me to run down what our charter is. Um, we've talked to a few people here already, but um, our focus in our focus in coming here today is to is to basically um, uh, do do hopefully a little bit better than just posting on your mailing list um, and come out and you know come out and talk to the group. So you've got a couple people here besides me um, who are you know who worked on this charter. One is uh, one's Micah. Um, and uh, Tim's been here as uh, Tim's been here as well. I think the other thing I want to highlight is um, people have asked, "Well, wait, if there's another SIG, is that another meeting that uh, that people at SIG off have to come have to go to?" And I we wanted to be really clear that we're no, you don't have to come to our meetings. We're not giving you another meeting. Our job will be to come to you. Our job will be to come to you if uh, if somebody starts a conversation about. Um, making a different default in code. And that's, it's time for us to go and talk to Sigoth about what that, you know, about the arguments uh, pro and pro and against. Um, uh, if there are, you know, if there are just like I've heard on this call about, you know, conversations over API and so on, it's the, we'll be having to go and, and uh, walk around to the other SIGs and that's uh, just the way we see it. Um, uh, I think I, I didn't cover this out of scope section. I think it's actually really important. So um, first and foremost, we don't expect to own any of the Kubernetes project, uh, sorry, any of the any of the code that goes into a running cluster. Um, if we have code, um, it may be for, uh, it may be for helping manage the vulnerability um, announcement and management process. Um, it might be, but it's, it's not, it's not going to be a code that goes in a cluster. Um, it, sorry, it's not going to be code that's that's required in order to run a cluster. Another example would be that if we were to say create a um, a, a, a benchmarking tool that checked against the Kubernetes hardening guide, you know, these are the things you got, these are the things that you that you don't have. Um, that would be code we might own. Um, there are, uh, I think that Tim and Micah can talk to you about some of the other examples um, if you ask us and trying to look at anything else on the out of scope that's really useful to that's really useful to share um, um, can I ask you a question yes please Th thank you <laughs> I'm really happy to stop monologuing so uh, I see that like out of scope is like cloud provider specific or distribution specific hardening guides um, I, I guess like as an individual you know it's like if I was new to kubernetes and I wanted to like make sure my kubernetes was hardened Right? Like I could certainly follow a guide and try to like very carefully make sure, like, you know, let's pr pretend I don't want to buy something. I just want to run. Sure. You know, right. Um, how would I know that I was successful in my hardening? Right. Like part, part of the reason people like lean on this bit right here is it's someone else's problem. And like yeah. they pay them to assure you that the hardening has been done. Um, so like I, I, I 
I understand that you guys don't want to own code. Would you, is like, I don't know, a test harness code? Is that like, does that count as code? Like, could you have like a, run this little suite against your cluster and it will echo back if you want. I think that's exactly the kind of code we would want, that we would want to own. I think that, I think that um, in getting, in getting the, the benchmarks that have happened outside with CIS um, or with other groups to, to, you know, to actually have something in the Kubernetes project, I think that it's very, very naturally, you know, it's very, very naturally going to be that there's, that there's then an open source, you know, that there's open source code to check, um, to check against a doc. And, um, you know, I think an easy way to say it, you know, an easy way to think about is, uh, you know, Liz Rice over um, Liz Rice's uh, both an both a maintainer on the CIS benchmark and a you know author and maintainer on uh, Kube Bench, um, the tool for checking you know a one of the open source tools for checking against that benchmark. Um, not to sign her up for more work, um, but I think that the folks that are writing the hardening guide are going to be especially interested in there being a tool. I know that I'll be very interested. I I wrote the CI I wrote uh, CIS's original. Linux and Unix um, auditing tools that audited that audited um, each of the Unices. This was a long time ago, obviously, since there were other Unices, but you know, audited previous DHPUX and AIX and each of the Linux distributions. Um, I'll also say that the cloud provider specific or distributor specific hardening guides, I think that's a place where um, I think that's I think we're I, I want to say that I think that's a soft one. Um, you know, if if it turns out, I'm trying to think of like if I think about distributor specific, when I look at installers, um, and if I if I look at installers or open source distributions, is that a, uh, the those that are the most popular will end up almost certainly either being um, either ending up in scope or you know uh, in demand to be in scope for hardening guides and for checking tools. I, I guess maybe in a different way of asking that is. Like if if one of the if the SIG cloud provider or some of the maintainers of particular distributions wanted to collaborate to say like here here's sort of the the recommended hardening we we understand that you don't have the expertise or the desire or the <laughs> the uh, staffing to manage those guides but we're interested in contributing that like would that be something you would Welcome, or would you say, "Oh no, like we, we must keep this documentation <laughs> totally neutral and never mention anything that has a trademark associated with it"? Or like, because that that discussion has come up for some of the documentation. Oh, um, sure. I'm curious, like, yeah, where where you would envision that landing? So I, I'm, uh, there's a certain there's a certain extent to which I can speak for for a group, and a certain extent to which I'm, you know. You have to realize you get into my pers into my personal opinion. So, um, I want to I want to now say that we're headed a bit into my personal opinion, and I, I may be pretty um, outspoken at times, um, but uh, I don't want to make any promises for anyone in that way. So, I I would say, so you've got you've got if you had cloud provide can we can we nail this down to uh, thinking about either cloud providers or um, I think about OpenShift as kind of a product, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, can we uh, can we make our question more specific to one of those, just to make it a little bit easier to reason? Can, on, like, on three uh, can I jump in, Jay? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so um, I I think this isn't a a question that's specific to security, unique to security. Um, I'm I'm sure this comes up in a lot of other contexts. Um, around storage, around SIG cloud provider, around installers. Um, and so I think that I would want to just look towards, um, like talk to SIG docs, talk to SIG cloud provider, um, and figure out what the, uh, what the norms around this are um, for existing documentation and just try and be consistent with that. Um, I, you know, if that means uh, each cloud provider gets their own documentation page that they can Kind of have some ownership of, or if we have some master list where we link out to cloud provider specific hardening guides, um, yeah. Okay. The the other question I had around the horizontal security documentation, um, it was hard for me to tell sort of how deep 
that was intended to be? Like, is that down to sort of the operating system level? Like, if you're running this operating system, you really need to set this sys control and like turn off this thing and turn on this networking thing and turn off that firewall thing. Like, um, is it? Are you envisioning something all the way down to the OS level? I don't. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I want to say I don't imagine that. Um, however, if I think about, you know, if I think about, um, I'm just, I'm trying to come up with a good example, but it's, you know, if you get into, um, if you get into, um, into admission control, and there are, you know, and there are settings you're, you're suggesting, you'll start to get into the, um, you may end up outside of Kubernetes, an example, you know, um, I'm trying to think of a, of a decent example, kind of like the. Uh, Here's one. Uh, uh, let's say you want to control set comp, uh, set comps, or you want to control uh, which user you run as, yeah. and that's an important thing for containing your container. But there isn't something on by default in Kubernetes, and probably in the fairly near future, won't be something to turn on in Kubernetes at all to control that. Would you mention that sort of control in a horizontal security documentation? I, I have to, this is my opinion, and Tim, please, Tim or Micah, please uh, contradict me at will. Um, like you've just named a couple, you've just named a couple really clear, you know, uh, clear ones that, that I think make it into any hardening guide, right? So um, it's hard to talk about I mean, I, in my mind, it's hard to talk about hardening Kubernetes without ending up in kind of the full gambit of, you know, the pod security policy um, of the, you know, of admission control in general. And so, yeah, if there's, if there is a, if there's an OS setting or a container runtime setting that has to be set in order to permit that, um, in order to permit admission control, um, and some, you know, in somewhat granular mission control recommendations, then yeah, I think we have to comment on it. Um, we have to write, we have to write a how-to on it. I think there's sort of three different types of uh, settings that could kind of come into play there. One is uh, what David just mentioned is like, there's a feature that Kubernetes can take advantage of if it's enabled in the kernel. So we might say like, you know, you need to choose, you can choose between SE Linux or App Armor, um, you know, if you have user namespaces enabled, um, then we don't do anything with it, unfortunately, but maybe someday we will. <laughs> um, so there's those kind of like features we can take advantage of. Then there's features that kind of have more interaction or implications of uh, with Kubernetes. Um, uh, I can't remember exactly what it was, but there was a recent vulnerability around um, IPv6 um, uh, masquerading, um, and there's a, a setting that you can flip on. Um, uh, uh, I think there's a, a um, SysCL sorry, I'm, setting. Yeah, yeah, syscuttle on the Ethernet adapter um, to kind of block that attack vector. Um, that's pretty specific to the Kubernetes networking setup. Um, so that I could also see in the hardening guide. And then you get into the like general like Linux hardening of like, you know, how to manage your SSH credentials. Um, and that's the sort of thing that I would say is uh, probably more out of scope. That's, that's my opinion too. Like I know I didn't answer that part of your question, Jordan, but yeah, if we're, if we're talking about, you know, how do you manage your SSH credentials? What goes, you know, what do you do with, with, with host.allow um, for things that are, you know, for things that are compiled against LibRAP and so on. I think that, I think that stays, I think that stays out of scope and you, um, because I think you're honestly just from a workload perspective, um, because just doing a, just doing a complete hardening guide for a Linux distribution, um, it's a reasonable effort and then you get into differences between distros. Um, also, as a more meta comment, um, this is a proposal around starting up a kind of new sub-community to talk about these sorts of questions and to figure these things out. And so I imagine like that'll be part of SIG Security sub-project 
uh, sorry, security docs subproject is defining what's in scope for the docs. Um, so we're sort of laying out kind of the broad scope here, um, but then I would expect a lot more discussion to happen. After. Yeah, I, I think the thing I'm trying to figure out is, like if, if this is a SIG that is primarily oriented around like discussion and best practices and communication and like documenting hardened guides and coming up with maybe tests to verify you follow the hardened guide, but it doesn't actually own the code that a lot of those things depend on. I'm, I'm just trying to imagine how those discussions, like if, if a discussion happens and consensus emerges, but then like at, at what point are the, the various teams, SIG Node or uh, SIG Auth or API Machinery or whoever, um, like if consensus emerges before the SIGs are involved, then do you have to re-have those conversations? And if you get the SIGs involved as part of building that consensus, it sounds like just another like multi-SIG meeting time. Maybe I'm pessimistic. <laughs> I'm somewhat worried about the same thing. Like I'm thinking through things like it would be really good if there was a way to limit the number of IOPS uh, a particular container could have. Uh, as an example of a problem that we've seen bite people. Um, and if you try to have that discussion without SIGNode and without Cryo, I'm not really sure how you would fix it. I, not, not to discourage the goal. Like I, I think the things that are called out here are things that have either been neglected or haven't been coordinated well. I'm just trying to think practically, like what would this look like? Would it look like here's a list of topics we want to tackle and we'll set up a particular meeting where we're going to talk through this and make sure the right people are there as part of that? Um, what, what I want to avoid is like SIG security becoming uh, like someone assumes, oh, well, we talked about it in SIG security and no one voiced opposition, so everybody must agree, like, this is the way. And then, like, all the various people who are actually responsible for making it happen are like, wait, what? I didn't even know this meeting was happening. <laughs> like, all SIG security formed consensus on was that they wanted to open a PR. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would say, so, Tim, I hope you'll help me out here if I, uh, if I flounder in this, in this question, but... Um, in my mind, until the until the relevant SIGs that own the code um, are involved in the conversation, the conversation isn't finished, right? It's kind of the, um, some part of this is, listen, every bit of, like, we've we've looked at two hardening guides, we've written the Kubernetes official, you know, we think we should write in the official hard and Kubernetes hardening guide that you should do X. Um, um, well, gosh, you know that one of the very next questions that anybody would have is, well, why isn't this the default? And, you know, of course, part of what we're going to do is say, dude, changing defaults is a lot harder than, you know, is a lot harder than you think. But another part is it's time for us to, it's time for us to come to each of the, to each of the relevant SIGs and say, um, this is what's, uh, this is what's getting talked about. This is what's happening in the hardening guides. Um, you know, what's the first, what do you see as the, you know, what's going to break when we try to, when we try to do that, when people try to set that setting, um, you know, we've seen, we can think of this, but you're right. As you say, you're writing the, you're writing the code and planning the code. Um, and then, um, and then second, uh, Hey, can this become a default? And to basically for lack of a better way, for lack of a better verb, lobby the SIGs um, that own the code um, for, you know, moving defaults. Um, but I think until the SIGs that own the code are involved, um, in the conversation, it's not over, but man, I think we can save you a lot of effort. I think we can save you a lot of, you know, like imagine, imagine that conversation's finished. What we've, what we, what's come out of that conversation is you can't do that. It will break X. Once that's been done, 
we could handle that question, like we can handle that debate six months later when somebody, when new people join and say, but, but why aren't you doing X? And it's, it, it, it's no, you can't do X. SIG off has told us this because, um, I don't know, that's, that's yeah. part of the other, uh, I think that's part of where I'm going. Um, two things I'd like to add to that. Uh, one, um, uh, Jay mentioned this earlier, um, but we really see it as uh, part of the responsibility of SIG security to reach out to the other SIGs. Um, and so to show up at SIG node and say like, hey, we're working on this hardening guide. Here's some of the things that we've thought of, like is there stuff we're missing? Is there, are there issues with this? Um, and, uh, and get input from the other SIG communities. Um, and then the other piece of it is just kind of from a pragmatic standpoint, uh, these discussions are already happening um, and they're happening outside of the Kubernetes community today. They're happening in, um, well, outside of the, you know, SIG community, um, Kubernetes is broader community, but like, um, this is already happening through um, the CIS project uh, and in kind of like uh, hallway tracks and other discussions, there isn't a clear gathering point for these um, within the Kubernetes community. And so the idea is to kind of like bring that into um, the sort of official uh, Kubernetes community structure and then also encourage that outreach to the other SIGs through that process. One thought I just had uh, that might be a, it doesn't need to go in the charter or anything, but just a, a way of thinking about it. If, if there's a change that someone wants to propose, like actually going through the, the kept process, at least in the, like, this is what I want to do and why, like, there's a lot of stuff in that template. Like, don't worry about the rest of the template, but this is what I want to do and why and identifying the SIG or SIGs that would be involved in that, that would probably be a good thing to get used to doing, especially for uh, something like SIG security, which is almost exclusively in that sort of communication and coordination role. Um, and what that lets us do is avoid sort of lengthy discussions and debates and consensus building before the actual stakeholders are really involved. So it identifies like, what do you want to do? Why do you want to do it? Who are the SIGs that need to be involved? And it, like writing is a really good exercise. <laughs> it makes you <laughs> figure out what you really mean. And it also gives us sort of a, a place of record where if what you want to do and why isn't going to work, we can document that and then decline the cap. Like that's yeah. not something we really do. It's technically part of the cap process, but I think that would be really useful to sort of get a written history of here are things people wanted to do and why and why it was declined. Um, so yeah, uh, that just occurred well, to me that that I would think, be a good thing. I think that's really great. It also means that, um, you know, that, that caching function too. It also means that when the third cap comes in on the same, on very much the same thing, um, cause I swear as you get more, as you get more infosec people coming to the, coming to the project, they're going to, you're going to get a bunch of repeat. Um, and you can say, you know, let's reference this, let's reference this one. <clears throat> yeah. So my, my feedback on this is that I think these areas are underserved today and I'm happy to see someone paying attention to them. Um, I know how much overhead there is in sort of a SIG structure. And so one of the questions that I asked the folks proposing this was, do, do you, are you concerned about that overhead? Um, as long as the people who would be bearing the brunt of that overhead feel like it's worth it, I don't particularly object. Uh, but I just wanted to call call that out as a consideration. And then the other thing that I think there will be some confusion over is just the name. I think people will associate SIG security with like this SIG has the final say on everything security related. Like they can, you know, dictate whatever, whatever. Um, and I, I, I see that it's baked into the charter, like it's clear, but people won't read the charter. They'll hear, oh, SIG security. SIG security said this isn't okay, therefore da 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 da. So, um, that is a point of confusion on the CNCF SIG security. Yeah, I, so I will, I will promise, I will promise you both 
um, that I will write something uh, that I will submit a, a pull request on our README. Should we uh, should we be uh, should we be accepted? Um, that specifically says that we're not the decision making body, um, and uh, and talks about the uh, and talks about the six and the governance structure, because we may be. We may often be for security the first place people go when they have something to say, and that means we're going to be. Um, that means that we're going to we're going to have an education mission, and part of that, like we're going to have an education mission to tell them, well, hey, this is what it, this, this is this is what the cap is. This is what the cap process is. Here's how you can create a cap. Here's how you can look at the ones that already exist, so you're not suggesting. So you're not necessarily suggesting something that's already been done um, without reading everything that's gone into why we're why that's not happening. Um, I'm trying to remember what the, that was kind of a two part, it was kind of a two part. So the, the, the overhead of, the overhead of managing a SIG. Um, so I can, I can speak for the, for the people who are involved in this, um, especially for the, especially for the leads on the, on the security audit working group. Um, our working group has been a heck of a lot of work um, and, um, and we're really, um, and we are, so we feel like we have a pretty good picture of, of that overhead and we're willing to do it. And the nice, the cool thing has been that there's been enough energy that, that's come out of the community so far um, that we're, we're not short on people who want to help and are willing to, uh, and who are willing to help shoulder that, that overhead side. There's one thing I didn't, I didn't speak about in here. It's not really all that written into our charter, but it's but it's implied, um, and that was in. Um, can we scroll up just slightly? Um, that's in that security community management and and that security outreach, and um, and while it's called outreach, we also know that that's that part of what we're gonna that part of what we'll be seeing is some of the incoming, um, is some of the incoming conversations with people who aren't looking to immediately contribute to the project, but at least, but want to get conversations started um, about, you know, whether it's been the most, the most recent vulnerability in Kubernetes or, um, or some other security matter. Um, and, you know, we, uh, we, at one point we had in our charter, like, okay, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll take, we just cleared it out of the bolts to make the charter shorter, but, you know, we'll take incoming, um, incoming questions from press and public um, about Kubernetes security, and you know, obviously, a lot of those go to the PSC. But you know, one of the people who's on the charter, one of the people who's on this, who's on, who's who's signed our letter and worked on the charter here is, um, is Ian, who who was really clear with us and said, "Listen, if you if you think you can walk away from having to from having to be an um, an incoming you know an incoming channel for press or public questions." Um, yeah, you're probably, you know, we're probably wrong. Um, and part of what they said was, you know, right now on security, the reporters basically either call the people um, on the PSC um, who were part of announcing a vulnerability, um, or they call the three or four people they know. And uh, and so Ian is um, is part of our group, and Ian's handling. Uh, I would I would say Ian's handling a ton of our a ton of the incoming public and press uh, inquiries. So. Uh, maybe this will help spread that effort around. Well, I'll say I was glad to see that the charter was very clear that ownership for the code stayed with the SIGs, that they'd be contacted about the uh, security documentation that you would find them. Um, that's all good. Uh, I had one minor comment about the out of scope section. I would really like to see for each of the things that are out of scope, who actually owns them. Sure. Um, you did it for some of them, but not for all. Uh, and if we don't have owners for the things that are out of scope, I would worry about scope creep. I think we can fix that. I think one thing I'm noting is there's not, um, perhaps when we copy this from Google Drive to, uh, to, uh, to uh, GitHub, um, to Markdown, we didn't end up indenting some of these bolts that were indenting Google Drive. So like the embargoed vulnerability management, bug bounty, submission triage, non-public vulnerability collection disclosure, those are all meant to be indented under the bullet above private vulnerability response that ends with a colon. Um, so it's meant to be a list and I think that's our, 
um, I'm just going to call that um, our typo um, and not indenting it. And then I think the only other the only other things that are that don't have something listed, we we better fix that. So any projects outside of the Kubernetes project, um, at, at maybe we're maybe we're referring that to CNCF SIG security or um, cloud provider specific or distributor specific hardening guides. We've talked about how that's soft, but that would probably be see your you know see your distributor or cloud provider, and then recommendations or endorsements being out of scope um, is honestly, uh, I don't, I don't know what we'd put in parentheses there. We could put, we could put something snarky, but I think we're, we're just stuck with, that's our way of trying to say that, um, that we're not, we're not king making. Fine. There were a half dozen that I noticed. And if it's just yeah. application formatting, then that's great. Yeah. I think it's my, it's our fault. Uh, and I'll, it's probably my fault. Um, cause I was the one who copied the, who copied the Google drive. Thanks. Thanks, David. I, I'll fix it. I'm, my bad. Uh, since we only have a few minutes left, is there, from any of the SIG loops or really anyone on the call, is there any concerns with this moving forward? I, I think we've talked about it in the past some. Um, I think I generally agree with Jordan that this is a good idea and someone should hopefully own this. I do, I, I am wary about the name. Uh, it, it, I know it implies things in people's heads. At the same time, like six security docs or six security guides sounds really lame, uh, <laughs> to be very honest. Um, so, but I, I don't know what more we can do other than document that very clearly, uh, as MJ has mentioned. Both documenting it and uh, acting on it. So ma making sure that not only is it documented that like if decisions need to be made, it needs to go through this process. Like you need to propose a specific thing and get the right groups involved, but then actually sticking to that and, and saying like, if someone wants to make a proposal, that's great. Like we can help you find the right people to get involved and start working through that. Um, so yeah. And it sounds like the, the people leading this are committed to doing that. So that's great. We are. Uh, I was going to ask, uh, Jordan, you had suggested them using like part of the KEP process as like a lightweight way of documenting desired changes and sort of helping folks to be aware. Does that need to be in the charter somewhere? No, I, I don't. I mean, it, I don't think that belongs in the charter. The charter is clear about like, this is what this group does and this is what the group doesn't do. Um, I think going through the proposed motivated and relevant SIG bits of the kept template would be a great way to like execute that, uh, re redirecting a, a specific proposal to the right uh, groups. But that doesn't belong in the charter. That's an implementation detail. I think we can create some, um, some documentation that even takes an example um, I'm not promised to do that right now, but I think that we can absolutely create some documentation that, that creates an example because that's going to save us a lot of effort and also, uh, I hope, um, continue to build the, the trust that uh, it sounds like you're expressing for our work, Jordan. Cool. Does anyone else have further comments? Or can we get three minutes back. Cool. All right. Uh, well, thank you for attending, everyone, uh, and we'll see you in two weeks. Thanks for letting me speak.